Today, I want to speak about your personal revival. You've heard of revival in different parts of the world. We are a nation, a community that has experienced a revival. Not many places in the world can say like what we say here in Shillong and Meghalaya, that we have experienced revival. Our four parents have enjoyed revival from the time that they received the gospel. And I want you to understand something very clearly, that that is exactly how we should continue to apprehend, to be excited about revival. But it must begin from your personal revival with the Lord. I remember the time when we were invited, Pastor Sharon and I, to be in a gathering of many believers in Delhi. And wherever we were invited, people already knew that we came from a place where we enjoyed revival. And so they asked, how was it? Uh, what is it all about? They, they were hungry. Because for them, revival means face to face with Jesus. For them, revival means we are so much in heaven at that moment. And if you understand the true essence of the word revival, you realize that that's exactly the truth. To be up close and personal with Jesus. Look at my hand. Up close and personal with Jesus. And living in an atmosphere of heavenly glory. Now, a personal revival is a sudden spiritual awakening. So you can become a vibrant believer who is fully charged always alert and ready and willing to move as God directs. That's a revivalist. You see, a revivalist is not somebody who comes into a place and then revival comes in. Actually, the, of course that is true to a certain degree of definition, but the real truth of the word revivalist is that this revivalist is a man who lives in unending revival. He's always alive. He's always in the presence of the Lord. So personal revival means that you are soaking in the presence and in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which keeps us from sin, frees us from satanic yokes, from satanic bondage, and makes us a heavenly focused child of God. What comes to mind at this moment is Psalm 85 verse 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? So if you look at this Psalm, you would notice that once you receive revival, you rejoice. Revival and rejoice are one and the same. You cannot rejoice until you're being revived. But the minute that you are revived, you cannot help but rejoice. Are we clear? So personal revival will take us to a place of delirious joy that only heaven can offer. But it doesn't end there. Personal revival empowers you to continue with the awesome works Jesus started while he was here on earth. He himself declared in the gospel of John in chapter 14 and verse 12, he said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to the Father. I am going to the Father. I have a series of questions that should take us to important answers from the Holy Spirit regarding personal revival. 
The first question I would like us to look into is, but why do we need a personal revival? Isn't revival meant for the church, for the community, for groups of people, for the entire nation? Just recently, we heard of revival in many universities in the United States. Ashbury comes to mind quickly. But why do we need personal revival? Ready for the answer? Number one, it is the only way that the revival without end will overwhelm the body of Christ before the Lord's second coming. Did you know that when Jesus comes back to earth, there will be an endless revival all over the nations in different parts of the world? I will not say that all of the world will go through revival, but many portions of the world, and in those portions of the world where revival will be released, many people will be hungry and thirsty for Jesus already as he arrived. Get the picture? So, how can the, the church be prepared and ready for glorious manifestations in the last days when so many believers have no personal relationship with the Lord? How can they meet with the Lord when they don't even know the Lord? when they have not had any kind of intimacy with the Lord. If we are to become citizens of the kingdom of God, we must start living its lifestyle here and now. Amen? If the church is stagnated, lethargic, and fruitless, that means its members are in a spiritual coma and need to be revived. Hey, get up. They need to be revived quickly. Slapped also. On a personal level. Get up, get up. We need that if we are to be ready when Jesus arrives. Number two, personal revival will keep us from being a yo-yo Christian who is up today and then down tomorrow. Such fluctuations will produce guilt, frustration, and disappointment that weigh people down. No doubt it is good to have anointed guests, ministers, and services that can stir up a revival. But there is no guarantee that results will happen. If after such events, the people ministered to cannot remain vibrant and alive spiritually, then such a church will relapse back to a state of spiritual barrenness and desolation. The people never experience any real personal revival that should have transformed and made them new. They were just excited and moved by the speaker or the service. But deep within their hearts, they are still bound in their old habits, the same demons, and their lifestyle is nothing but soggy religiosity and hypocrisy. The truth is, many churches are clueless about revival, even after a revival service. If you find yourself in that condition, beware. If you have no idea what revival is all about, even during a revival service, you're like, you're lost, you're disoriented, you're not very sure then you are in a dangerous place. You are in a place where no revival is happening for you when revival is happening all around you. That is why you need personal revival. Number three. However, anybody who is personally revived can make a big difference. When God wants to do a new thing, bring about a turnaround, a deliverance, or a transformation in a family, he doesn't need everyone in that family to be spiritually alive and on fire before he can intervene and bring about a change. Listen, with just one person who is personally revived, God will make his next move of great exploits. He said himself in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 22, verse 30, I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall 
and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it. But I found no one. Imagine God when looking for somebody who is virtuous enough to pray for his land, for his people, for his nation, for his community, and there was none. During the days of Ezekiel, there was none. I am afraid that in this day and age, God is also looking for people who will release revival in our land that is known as the, the land of revival. But God finds no one. It is clear that with just one personally revived person, God was ready to bring about a mighty deliverance to the whole nation. God is still on the hunt for such a one, even today. Will you be the one? In Genesis chapter 18, verse 26 to 33, God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But he told Abraham that he wouldn't destroy the city if he found just 10 people who were in right standing with him there. God wasn't waiting for the whole city to be revived before he would bring deliverance and restoration to the land. In fact, if Abraham had gone on to pray to God to look for just one person who had a personal revival in Sodom or Gomorrah, I believe God would have spared them all. Listen, even today, many of us still do not see the worth of a single person who can change the destiny of many. But God did. That's why he sent just one man to save the world. But what are the characteristics of those who are personally revived? Second question. What should be the nature, the characteristics, the behavior, the perspective, the principle of a person who can be personally revived? Answer number one. God can rely and depend on them. God can rely on such a person who is personally revived. In the Gospel of Luke in chapter 14, verses 16 to 24, Jesus told a parable of a great feast where the host invited people to come. But many started giving all kinds of excuses to claim that they had to attend to urgent business matters. While another had just gotten married and he was on the way to the honeymoon. <laughs> and the pretenses, the excuses kept pouring in. So sorry, the RSVP was always, sorry, I can't, sorry, I can't, sorry, I can't. The truth was that they had no regard for the one who cared to invite them to the feast. Many have no love for God and will always have a perfect excuse to justify why they cannot pray, read the word, or do the things of God. I've heard those excuses. I used to bring up those excuses when I was away from the Lord, long time ago, when I was just a religious person, when I was very young. I would find excuses. Oh, it's too hot. Oh, it's too cold to go to church. But then again, it was very difficult for me to understand that there were excuses. I thought God understood. Only in the here and now I realized I was in love with somebody else, not with him. And so when you're not in love with God, but you're in love with the things of this world, you will have excuses. You will have pretenses. You will have all kind of, of reason why you cannot get close to the Lord. But when you are revived, you will prioritize God 
before anything else in your life. Nothing matters more to you than God. If you hear the offer, like what we did last Sunday, would you like to get into water baptism? Yes! Would you like to join into the SWAT team? Yes! Would you like to be proactive for the Lord? Yes! Even before the question would be over, yes, yes, a thousand times, yes. Why? I'm excited for Jesus. I'm in love with Jesus. Anybody here is deeply in love right now? You'll do anything for that one. You'll sacrifice anything. Nothing is too hard. Nothing is too difficult. Nothing is impossible. You become super person. If you're a girl, a super girl. If you're a boy, you're a superman. For the one that you love. If you're in love with Jesus, you will have no excuse to be with him. So when you are revived, you will put God first before anything else. Psalm 42 verses 1 and 2 says, As the deer pans for streams of water, so my soul pans for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? When can I go and meet with God? Every morning my prayer is, when are you coming back? So I hear bad news and I think that the world is persecuting the church and I believe that the world is against and that demons and um, all of the negativity and the sinful things in this world are aggravating the situation of the world. Somehow in the depths of my heart, I am excited. Because a sin abounds, that means his coming is not very far. If you have intimacy with the Lord, let me tell you this, you will never reject the invitation to spend time with him or obey him in any way. Clearly, many are not interested in being personally revived because if they were, they would know that no business or family Commitment can be more important than being in the presence of the Lord. You see, the rich young ruler who came to meet with Jesus, he was self-righteously keen to know. Ah, hey, Jesus, come here, come here. What must I do? So, you know, it can be arranged that I can have eternal life. I mean, what must, I know, you just have to give me the answer. You don't have to do anything. The cross, chill, Jesus, chill. No problem. I can handle it. I'm rich. I'm young. I'm a ruler already. I mean, achievement. Oh, la la. So Jesus, when you come to me, I just need your advice. I don't need you to do anything. So what must I do that I can have eternal life? And the Lord Jesus says the Bible surprisingly that he looks at him and he likes him. But... The Lord Jesus gave him an ultimatum. An ultimatum. He said in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 19, verses 21 to 22, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth he wasn't just rich he had great wealth god cannot rely or depend on anyone who is not personally revived because such a person would always have an excuse not to be where god wants him to be or do what god wants him to do there are some of you here you have prayer requests some of you have met with me personally and you've asked for me to pray for you and I've prayed for you and I'm still praying for you. You have these prayer requests. You have all of these things that you need in your life. You need healing. You need deliverance. You need breakthrough. You need a good job. You need status. You need provisions. You need deliverance. You need breakthroughs. You need favor. Oh, so many needs, needs, needs. Well, God just needs you to be where he wants you to be. You see, it's going to rain down. Don't be running. Stay in the place where God has placed it so that you will receive. Just obey. Just trust. If you will obey, if you will trust, 
If you will believe, you will receive. Amen? Sadly, those who rejected the invitation in Jesus' parable, they were replaced by others who accepted to come. When you refuse to be personally revived, God can easily replace you with those who will say yes. May we value God and his kingdom above everything. And may our divine assignment and our God-ordained destiny not be given to someone else. I don't want my place in the heart of my father to be occupied by somebody else. I want me. There, I'm selfish. My place, me, I go. No, nobody else. Not even my wife, not even my children, not even any one of you. Don't you dare to take me up my place. It's mine. You got it? Mine. Amen? You need to be like that. You need to be like that. You need to grab it when it comes to you and Jesus. A little amen, please. Number two, their lives inspire and challenge others positively. Jesus is a perfect example of living in perennial personal revival mode. His disciples were greatly inspired, challenged, and encouraged by his prayer life. His disciples in Luke chapter 11 verses 1 and 2 ask him to teach them how to pray. Listen, listen to this. Now, if Jesus had a lukewarm prayer life, they would have not have bothered to learn from him. They would have not bothered to come to Jesus, Lord, please teach us how to pray. Why? Because they see him, how he prays. They'd not be interested, right? But it was because they were amazed by his consistent commitment and appetite for prayer that they sought his fiery heart for God. They see what he's God, and they want it too. He sees somebody with a new jacket or even a new pen. <laughs> From where did you get? How much? New shoes. Do they have my size? Where? Why? We like. We also want. So when they look at Jesus, and they saw how he prayed, how he prepared himself so that he can minister to the needs of people. They want that too. They want it so much, so badly, that you know what? In the book of Acts, they spend 10 days praying, doing nothing. No worship, no music, no ministering, nothing. They just had prayer revival. They had a personal revival. 10 days, 10 nights. Holy Spirit hit them. After that, they walk out everywhere. Even their shadow now heals people. Remember Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do in my name? We've never heard anywhere in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where it says the shadow of Jesus healed people. Now it's the shadow of a blustering, impetuous man by the name of Kepha. Who's that? Peter. His shadow start healing people. Why? In the second chapter of Acts, he had personal revival. Amen. Is your relationship with God so full of dedication and commitment that you inspire others to want to spend more time with him or do more for him? Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. King Darius was forced to punish Daniel for breaking the law because he kept up his daily prayer to God despite the law that forbade anyone from doing so. However, when Daniel was brought out unscathed after spending the whole night in the lion's den, the king was moved to recognize the authority and the glory of Daniel's God. When people come near you, do they stay blunt or they get sharper? Are they spiritually strengthened or weakened? When they listen to you talk, when they look at you the way you dress, your body language, 
your food habits, your drink habits, your walk, your work, your commitment, your prayer life, the way you attend church, the way you leave from here with the fiery glow of the Holy Spirit, are they encouraged or are they disgusted? Answer that question yourself. Number three, they are carriers of fresh anointing. They are carriers of fresh anointing. Many are fascinated by those who are anointed for God's work. But the truth of the matter is that every Christian is anointed by God when the Holy Spirit takes over our lives on the day we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. However, how we respond to the anointing of God makes the difference. Some allow the oil of the Holy Spirit to dry up and become stale and refuse to pursue a fresh anointing every day. Psalm 92 verse 10, But my horns you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. No wonder by verse 14 of that same psalm, we read, They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. The opposite of fresh is what? Old. Or decaying, stale, insipid, rotten. Many believers today are carrying old and stale oil because we are not personally revived. This is the spirit of lethargy, laziness, and complacency that stagnates in past testimonies, encounters, and exploits. You know what? Some love to talk about what they did for God many years ago or when they were in their former church. Sadly, there is no record or testimony of what they are doing for God today. They like to relate ancient history about their spiritual achievements in life. But you ask them, how was God with you this morning? Mm, 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 nothing. Now? Mm, mm, you, okay. My dear friend, if you're personally revived, people will not ask a question. People will look at you. They get closer to you, their phone goes zzzz. They get again zzzz. Why is that? It's got power saturating. Please understand this. God is always in the mix of your life. You just need to be personally in touch with him at all times. Note that down. Write it down. Don't look at me. You need to be personally in touch with him 24-7. Once again, let me say this. You need to be personally in touch with him 24-7. Amen? You see, when you're not coming to God daily to be renewed, your calling and mandate will dry up quickly because you haven't received anything new and fresh to be in tandem with God's next move for today. Worse still is that many pride themselves in their all anointing. They feel they have done more than enough to complete their mission. And God should be impressed. Sadly, they grow religious and become offended if a fresh wave of anointing there shift the status quo and bring in new changes. They live in the past and they are proud of bygone glories. Disregarding the fact that God is dynamic and is always doing a new thing right now. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Listen, yesterday's anointing is not enough for the challenges we are given to tackle today. The anointing of yesterday was meant for yesterday issues and problems. And so for the issues that you're going to face today, you need a fresh new anointing. You need a personal revival this morning when you got up. 
Can I say amen? You need a personal revival right here, right now. Amen? You see, the anointing in a person's life is not meant for personal gloating, but for God's glorification. Skills, talents, gifts, resources, and potentials which God gave each of us will decay. If you are not using them to bless others, you need to bless the world. You've been born with a vision and a purpose to bless the world. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, that fear that is in the inside of you, that does not come from God. That comes from the enemy who wants to disrupt your connection, who wants to steal your thunder, who wants to limit your role. Get connected with Jesus and let him come into your life and saturate you with his goodness and his greatness and then see how things work. Last question. How can we experience this personal revival, Pastor Lam? How can we experience it? Well, number one, acknowledge that we need revival. How do you get money? By acknowledging that you need money. How do you get healing? By acknowledging that you do not have healing and you want it. So acknowledge that we need revival. Unless we confess our inability and powerlessness without the anointing of God, we will always depend on the various forms of religiosity and try to get on by our own efforts. Many are offended with the mere mention of revival because they are afraid of losing control and recognition. If we acknowledge that it is not about us, but all about the Lord and His kingdom, then our humility will bring God's empowerment that will surpass our own flesh and human decision. Please understand this. If you will not humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. I need you to quicken me. I need you to empower and equip me. I need you to direct my every single step. Then you know what? If you will not say that, if you will not admit that, you will always be doing things below par. Average or even less than average. Your contribution into the kingdom of God will not be a contribution. It might even be an irritation. The Jewish religious leaders were afraid and offended when they realized that Jesus and his disciples were under the authentic move of God. They clearly saw an anointing that ignited miracles and tangible revival. But they arrogantly chose self-promotion instead. Many are still like the religious leaders today. They have a hidden agenda. Some secret ulterior motives. Even when they come to the place of worship. Even when they come to a place of service. Why? Because the self is not dead as yet. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself. Then take up the cross, then follow me. But first, deny yourself. Because unless you deny yourself, nothing you do will glorify God. Everybody will look at you and say, Ni, uff. They'll always see a man. They'll always see a woman. They'll always see your personality. They'll always see your ability, your talents, your craft, your manipulation. Sadly, they will never see God. But if you humble yourself and say, Lord, no matter what happened, you move in me and through me, then the world will see not only you, but the God in you first. Can I have an amen? Until we give up confidence in our flesh 
and the outward form of religion, we will never encounter revival. Oh, please. Revival will not come into your life if you have the agenda of the flesh. Jesus already cl clarified in John chapter 15, verse 5. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. When we acknowledge that we are weak, empty and dry without the Lord's anointing, then we can be sure that we are on the road to a personal revival. A long time ago, God asked me, what do you want? God the Father asked me, what do you want? And the only answer I had was, I want to be used by you, but back me up in such a way that whatever I does will see your power in me and through me. It will be you working through me. And so the anointing hit. And so the gifting began. The favor rested. The breakthroughs and the turnarounds began. And we are here right now simply because God moves first in my life. Amen. Number two, take responsibility for your spiritual growth. The reason why we have so many believers today who aren't growing spiritually is because they are sold out to a human being, to a human figure or a denomination or a church or a ministry, a celebrity, a personality or a certain form of teaching, a doctrine even. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul is saying, whether you are under the direction of an anointed man of God or not, you must take responsibility for your own spiritual growth. We cannot be dependent on a person no matter how much we honor and emulate them. They may be the best example of human beings. We may even copy their style of dress, their hairdo, the car they drive, the accent they have. But at the end of the day, you're not worshiping them. You'll be worshiping Jesus. So therefore, more of Jesus Lest of me. Amen. God should be our only focus. That's the only way to have and maintain personal revival. The reason why Jesus grouped the virgins in Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13, into wise and foolish was because the wise ones had taken responsibility for their spiritual growth, whereas the foolish ones they were putting their spiritual growth in the hands of another person. That was why when their lambs went out, they thought they could borrow oil from those that still had some and they would be fine. The foolish virgins were used to seeking help from their wise friends. They've grown to become very intimate and very close with their friends, not with the bridegroom. They, they depended on them. They don't depend on him. However, that particular night, those who had been helping them could not do so. Why? Because the resources and the time available were very, very critical and limited. Even today, many naive believers feel confident running to one of God's servants to handle their situation. Any time that they are, in, they are encountering a problem, straight away they would start picking up the phone, calling this pastor, calling this preacher, calling this prayer warrior, calling this counselor, calling this mentor. I mean, it's not bad you calling them. But first call God. First get connected with your father. You realize something that is not right with your digestion. Or maybe you woke up with a 
bad headache, or maybe your vision are blurry, or maybe there's pain and aches in your joints, and you don't know what to do. Before you would be looking for prayer, before you would be looking for a doctor, start asking your father. Seek the advice and the help of your father, and you will find the answer who to approach, which place that you must go, which particular person who can help you. And then the road is smooth and easy. But otherwise, as soon as you face an issue, you're like, you, you're depending on the wrong kind of people. In fact, you're the one who's wrong because you depend on people. That is why it's trying to get healing through trial and error method. You're healed from these symptoms, but you get five other symptoms. Now it's scary. Now you're saying, God, what do I do? And he was like, huh? What do we do? We've got these five symptoms. He said, why didn't you come to me in the first place? You wouldn't have had any. The one that you had, that would have gone. Oh, like that, yes. So you know what? Yes, God's servants are not bad. They're available for us in time of our needs. But the Bible says, we can now approach the throne of grace in time of needs. You don't approach the throne of man. You approach the throne of grace in time of needs. God's servant cannot handle your situation. God can handle your situation through a servant as and when he directs you. But a day will soon come when those they depended upon will not have enough anointing to share. Each of us would have to give our own personal account before the Lord of the harvest. The time for receiving counseling and being prayed upon will then be over. Each of us will have to take responsibility and handle the situation of our spiritual growth ourselves. The foolish virgins had to rush and get oil for themselves. But it was right then that the bridegroom arrived and they missed him. By the time they got their oil and trimmed their lamps, it was too late. The door was shut. The feast had begun. But if they had taken responsibility for their spiritual growth, like the wise virgins, they would have had their own oil at the time that mattered most. My dear, we are not being wise. If we are depending on just the message in church or the prayers of a great leader to grow. Decide on your own right now. This is the day that I will fast. This is the day that I will go through a personal vigil whenever you feel the leading of the Lord. Don't wait for church programs. Don't wait for the, the core team or the board to decide that this is the day when we're going to have a conference. This is the day when we're going to do fasting. This is the day when... No. Get your program from God personally and let the personal revival get on. Study the Bible and other inspirational books and continue to pray so you can strengthen your walk with God. When those who are personally revived gather together, there will be a radical spiritual outpouring. There will be a spiritual awakening. Some of you, you can still remember, remember the spiritual awakening session we used to have? The revival meetings? Today's one. Today there is going to be a spiritual outpouring and it's beginning now. The presence of God's glory will be so mighty with awesome signs, wonders, and miracles. The fire of God will blaze and many around us will be convicted to repent and receive renewal. There will be an open heaven in our midst and great joy will be tangible, but it must all start with your personal revival. Heaven is waiting for you. What are you waiting for? Let's pray.
Bow your heads, close your eyes. Get into the receiving mode. Prepare. Prepare to receive. Prepare for a mighty anointing and a holy outpouring and awakening like never before. I don't want any one of you, please people, none of you leave this room, leave this place until you have had personal revival. Come on, say this prayer with me right now. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, let me not leave this place. Do not take me from here. I will not go home. I will not go out from here. Please, Lord, help me to receive personal revival. The revival that comes from you, Holy Spirit. A revival that comes from the pierced hands of Jesus. I want to receive it. I am hungry for it. I am thirsty for it. Fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready. Este maras to korayasha karabase. Hallelujah.